Hello, everybody. Thanks. Welcome to uh, Women in Entertainment, ushering in a new era of brand storytelling. Um, I'm Allison Hoffman. I'm the CMO of STARS Cable Network. Um, and I would love for this amazing panel to introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Tessa Blake. I am a filmmaker and a television director. Um, and I just uh, was shooting last night <laughs> until very, very late in LA. Um, so if I seem a little drowsy, that's why. Um, but delighted to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gretchen McCourt, and I, am, I have a consulting firm that helps creators and brands get their content and projects uh, into movie theaters and into new platforms. My background is theatrical exhibition. I was the head film buyer for AMC theaters for 19 years, and just recently with Arclight Cinemas as the chief creative officer and chief content officer for 10 years. Um, there's a lot of opportunity out there for this content, and that's what my um, my firm is is working on on bridging that gap. I'm also the co-founder with Renee of Women in Entertainment. And Women in Entertainment is bringing together thought leaders who are really shining a light on topics that are important to women and women mostly in the entertainment business. These people want to make change, um, and we're doing that through our network of creators, which we're so honored to have some of them here today. And you'll hear a little bit more about it in the panel, but that's what we're doing. I'm Renee Rossi. I'm also a co-founder of Women in Entertainment. I'm also the CEO and founder of Relativity Ventures, which works in the media, entertainment, and tech space on C-suite positioning and communication strategies. My name's Susan Cartsonis. I'm a film producer. I produced movies like What Women Want, um, most recently Freaky Friday the Musical, which was on the Disney Channel. And uh, I was a studio executive, and a, I built a company of my own. And I'm partnered in a company called Resonate Entertainment, um, which is a company that's focused on the female audience. Women are half of the ticket buying public, and we only make about 18% of movies for women. So it's bad business, and it's bad for the world in many ways that we all know. <laughs> Um, most of you might know me. My name is Angela Matusik. I'm the head of brand journalism at HP. Um, before I did that, I actually worked mostly in women's media. So I always was surrounded by women. My bosses were always women. I thought about women audiences all the time, and then I became a brand consultant. <laughs> so um, it's been, a, you know, I've learned a lot in the past couple of years of how things work differently in the marketing and advertising space. Um, and so I'm excited to be a part of this conversation and talk about what we're doing at HP. Hey there, I'm Sarah Klein. Um, honored to be on this stage with all of these amazing women. Um, I am the co-founder of a small production company called Red Glass Pictures. We showed a couple pieces um, about an hour ago, and we specialize in short form documentary um, based in New York City. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna start really broad, <laughs> which is how can women help brands tell their stories more powerfully? And um, I, I should also mention that I um, am, have had a long association with the American Film Institute and part of the American Film Institute, there's the directing workshop for women, which um, was perceiving this profound gap um, long before anyone else, 44 years ago. Um, and so we've been at it for a really long time, which is the good news, the bad news is self-evident, um, which is that the progress hasn't been made as far as any of us would like, it, you know, the it was really interesting sitting in here. I'm I'm not particularly I'm not a commercial I'm not a brand brand person, but I love the storytelling of the tiny short form that, um, and and I love the slightly longer form that the web allows for, and also the lower um, entry point in terms of the financial self distribution. There are a lot of models and opportunities. Um, Authenticity has come up a lot in here, and I think one of the things that we've talked about is that engaging filmmakers, like Sarah at the end of the panel doing the work for HP, means two things. One is that filmmakers know who they're making a film for, no matter how short that film, and they're speaking from a point of view. So you have an inherent authenticity, um, so that feels like a leverage point. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say, in making films, you often hear the term 
especially these days, um, the male gaze versus the female gaze. And I think um, that speaks to something Tessa was saying, but as women and who are very, as you know, powerful um, force in the world of consumer goods, I mean, it, some estimations are that women influence 90% of purchases, including the large purchases like cars. Um, you know, um, women can tell when there's a female perspective that isn't um, sensitive to the experience of being a woman. And I can tell in feature films, it, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a woman directing or a woman, woman writing, but it's somebody who's made it their business to embed themselves in the experience of what it's like to walk in the shoes of a woman, in the skin of a woman, to feel like being a woman. I, I judge the foreign films for um, the Academy, and many of those films are told um, about women, and some are told by women, and there was a particularly uh, amazing film from Russia called Aika, which was uh, the journey of uh, an immigrant woman from Kazakhstan coming to uh, Moscow, and it was told by a male filmmaker, and it was incredibly compassionate. The level of research that he had to do to get it there was amazing. He made it over six years, and he had an amazing actress. But when the care is taken and the time is spent with women to tell women's stories, we can tell. And since we're a powerful influence and you are brands, that's an important aspect to storytelling from my perspective. That's a really interesting point, and maybe somebody else wants to comment on that. Can men tell women's stories? I actually, I just yeah. want to say, I think yeah. men absolutely can tell women's stories. I agree. I just watched Eighth Grade on the plane on the way here, and it was like amazing. And you know, I actually, whenever I'm sure Sarah will have some opinions on this, but I don't think that women need to tell women's stories and men need to tell men's stories. I just think we need more diversity in all of our creativity, and it's about gender, it's about race, um, it's about age. You know, you don't have to just be under 30 to tell stories these days. Um, and I think that, that that type of diversity only benefits brands and businesses, and we actually have some data to prove it. I'm sure we'll get into that in a bit. But, um, you know, it's, it, I think that the sensitivity in filmmaking and being genuine and true, it, it, it doesn't really matter what your gender is. It matters, right, that you're... Well, yeah, I think, I think it's surprising to me... Um that we have to think about this in terms of, you know, um, can women tell good stories or why, you know, um, we need to make sure women are here telling stories. It seems like a, it's a disconnect, right? Because, um, you know, this idea even that as a sex we cannot be great storytellers has been constructed, <laughs> um, possibly because we weren't sitting in, at the table of the rooms making decisions for so many years. But, I mean, I was saying to Angela earlier, I have a six-year-old who plays with Barbies. Now, Barbies have kind of been, you know, everybody poo-poos Barbies, but I've actually decided to take a new approach with this. I watch her, she sets up full-on movies. She's directing them, she's putting them into scenarios. They're, you know, they are, um, if she's not a director, I, I don't know who is. And it's not because she's doing it for women, she's not doing it for men, she's doing it because she is uh, empathizing and becoming a part of a world that isn't hers. Women have been doing that since we were young. Um, so the idea that we couldn't then and shouldn't be a, a, if not an equal, if not greater force in storytelling now as, as adults, I mean, it seems it's, it's a disconnect, you know? I mean, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. So it's, it's, it's a question is what are, we, what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to say that we should be there equally or should we say, you know, or equally. is... Equally, equally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm equal often pay. asked, like, how did I become a director? And I was like, well, it went from bossing around my friends <laughs> to being called a director. I'm not sure where that happened exactly. Um, but I think the uh, piece of it about ownership is a really interesting one, and we're in a very hypersensitive time about who owns what story. Um, and my hope for all of us is that you know, it, w so statistically in film, um, you know, when you put a woman behind the lens in a producer or director capacity, to some extent writer, you radically and instantly change the diversity both of what you see on screen and what, whom you see on set. 
right? So it's like, it's a really super simple change actually, you just hire a female director and then 30% diversity emerges everywhere. Just that one shift, that one hiring position for producer director. So there's a sort of simplicity in some ways to this question to me. Um, but you know, I'm, I, I'm on a set right now and I'm one of three women on the set that's not an actress or in the makeup department, right? Um, you know, I walked onto a set not too long ago and the super nice craft services guy was like, hey, are you an actress? You know, he starts going through the list and I'm like, do I have men? I'm the director and he went, you're not what a director looks like. Um, and that was this week. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was this week. Um, so Barbie is an interesting thing. Right, like representation is an interesting it's thing. It's weird like, to bring Barbie into this, right? <laughs> no, but it's, it's interesting though, because it's we, about... We use Barbies all the time when we're doing, when we're trying to stage scenes before we shoot them. Yeah. We use them all the time. And They're very handy. And not to mention, I mean, I would say that I think if we, when we tell little girls that they shouldn't be playing with these dolls, I actually think it's a reverse effect. So it's yeah, that totally. weird, obviously the dolls need to look different, but as a, as a um, just an exercise in these little girls and little boys expressing their storytelling chops, it's not a bad start. And just to defend Barbie, I heard <laughs> that now there's a lot more yeah. um, yes. inclusion yeah. in Barbie. Yes. There's curvy Barbie, I'm happy to say. Yeah. And you know, Barbies of color, of course. And I love what you were saying about the below the line people. I was working um, in the film industry before I took my HP job and we had a film that was made by a, a female director and I interviewed all the behind the line people and they were just like, this was the most relaxed set I've ever been on. We got so much done, you know? And it was just like, you could just tell the vibe was great. But I wanted to say, because this is a room full of people like me, right? So we have brand content leaders, we have agency people. So that applies to other things too. And you know, when you go into companies, you see a lot of ladies in the communications department, and that might be about it. You know, we have agency meetings often. People come, they pitch me, they want to. They want our business, and I go to the meeting, and I'm surrounded by guys. And you know, we have to ask these questions of ourselves and of the companies that we hire. You have to ask them who works for you, who. What does your team look like? You have to ask that question. And and, and you know, at HP, we did set an example for this where we came up with. A, we called it a diversity scorecard, where we gave everybody that worked with us one month to give us a year-long plan and how they were going to increase their diversity over the next year. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. The first year, we had a 66% increase um, in all of our agencies in gender diversity, and the next year it was like 20% for racial diversity. And then it ended up that we got, um, you know, higher. Uh, what is it like? Uh, Purchase intent went up 20% for the creative that was made with that thing for that period. Um, but I just feel that if you don't ask that, if you just go about business as usual, you, yeah. you'll never get that female director, but, it's, but you have to go beyond whoever the CEO is and the first round of people that you meet and look behind them. Well, I think it goes back to something, Sarah, you were saying too. It's like theoretically, of course, right? Of course women can tell stories. Of course we want diversity and things like that. So why is it so hard to execute, you know, what, what, what are the perceived barriers for people in making that happen? Can I actually ask you to answer that question? I think, <laughs> um, because I think when we were out there, it's like we were talking about the risk of hiring females, and right now, in terms of how what brands are spending, yeah, um, and you know how to take that risk. So I'm going to actually turn that on you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, um, because I hire creative people all the time. I hire photographers and directors and things like that. Um, we found that we had to push ourselves because. You have a lot of money at risk, and it's very easy to go to the people that you're used to working with and the people that you're comfortable with. And you don't want to make a mistake. You don't want a bad ad outcome. And it's not that you think that there aren't other people who give you a bad outcome, but you just are on the line. And so it takes you, from, from my experience, making that leap and also making sure your teams know that you are behind them. We are going to make different decisions here. We are all supportive of this decision. We believe that we've hired the right woman for this job. And it's going to be a different experience. It's going to be new. And we, we're working together to do that. But I think there is a little bit of a comfort zone thing if we assume best intentions to all of this that people have to get over. I think you know the forces of unconscious bias, I feel really evangelical about talking about this because there's structural racism, sexism, and homophobia. There's bigotry, 
Um, I can't individually do much about either of those, but I can, um, we can collectively bring the unconscious to the conscious. So yeah. sociologically, that's called the comfort principle, right? right? So you hire inside of, it, it's really um, sneaky, right? Because you don't just hire the guy you hired before, you'll hire the guy who looks like the guy you hired before. Right? That's when somebody says to me, you're not what a director looks like, it's actually quite profound, right? Because I'm not actually what a director looks like yet, right? And I think it's also important to think about um, as the risk, why is Hollywood, and this is sort of Hollywood tangential, but, um, but money is such a huge piece of it, as the stakes increase, our unconscious bias is elevated. So, Often, unconscious bias is in direct contrast to our stated values, our stated values of equality, et cetera. But the moment we're confronted with a high-risk circumstance, mm -hmm. we revert to our unconscious bias deeply embedded, right? And it's important to remember history, too, which is that women were profound, you know, Alice Guy Blachet, who, about whom there's a documentary now, Be Natural, she had a huge film studio. She was the, first, the person who invented the close-up is lost to history. A woman who had a film studio in New Jersey making the most money in film in, you know, 1924 was a woman, not a man, right? So those pieces and those questions, but as money came into that industry, women fell out of it. Yeah. Our industry was dictated by the high stakes of finance and women fell away from that. In film, it's definitely that the decision making at the highest level is made by guys who are more comfortable about, they're more comfortable with guy related subject matter and guys executing that guy related subject matter. It's just a, a matter of affinity. I don't think that there are people who would in any world consider themselves sexist. Mm -hmm. They just have an affinity for their own gender. You see it, I remember we go on market research trips to test a film in a market and we get on a small private plane and the filmmaking team would be there. There was one in particular, I remember Bette Midler was in there and her partner Bonnie Bruckheimer was there and I was there and there was a female executive and everybody else on the plane about um, 10 other people were guys. And as the flight went on, because you didn't have to wear your seat belts, it was like there was a sorting machine and all the men went to one side of the plane and all the women to the other. You see it at parties too. There's this sort of natural thing. We have to get out of our comfort zones. And when I say we, I mean, Men. Really, the men. Because, <laughs> I have, I have, because and, and I say that with affection. And, uh, I have a great Because we will make it better for you. The, the, you know, when there is equality, we do make the working environment on a set, in an office, anywhere, better for everybody. And I have women, an anecdote I wanted to share. Because I think it. it's... Um, it, uh, when you think about what you were just saying, it really comes from the top down, right? And so you need that sort of advocate. And... Um, I was, when I first joined AP, HP, our um, CMO then was this man, Antonio Lucio, he's at Facebook now, and he was like, diversity is just his passion point. It's one of the reasons why I took the job too. So it's like he just eats, sleeps, and breathes diversity. And we were in a, a meeting, my first meeting with him, and a digital agency was pitching us. I'm not gonna name names, but there were two men and two women, from four people from this company, in this room with other HP executives, and they, the men did all the talking and the women operated the PowerPoints. And we all watched the, the presentation and then at the end of the meeting, Antonio said, well, that was really interesting, but I have to say, I am wondering why you brought two women with you and you didn't have them speak at all. Um, you know, I, we, I really believe that everybody who attends meetings with me has to have a role and I want to hear what they have to say. And I was just like, yes! But I, but I think that type of courage and dedication from everybody is what you start to have to move the needle. That's really interesting. What do people feel is the <coughs> responsibility and obligation of men in all of this? Well, one of the things that, and it kind of builds on what Tessa was saying about the diverse um, crew that a woman brings, that 30%, what we've heard in our panels uh, you know, from other filmmakers that, that echo that same thought, is then the next project that that group works on, the men, start bringing diversity and women onto the set where if they hadn't had that first experience, it would have again been all men, all men, but they, I mean, they quickly see it and it starts spreading out. And we've heard that from a lot of different, uh, a lot of different filmmakers. 
Well, I would also say that it's also the responsibility of women, too, to bring men into the conversation. I think it's a 50-50, and I think that's where the equality comes through. You know, and I think something with women in entertainment that we found is, especially in this environment, men are not, it's become a little bit of a hostile environment. <laughs> um, and, you know, we struggle finding men who want to mentor women. Um, you know, we've asked so many men to come in to talk to our, in our workshops, in our summits. Um, you know, and we had a workshop, I want to say two or three years ago, and we asked a leading executive, not to be named, um, to come in, and his response was, well, what am I going to, I don't want to walk into this room and be attacked by women, you know, and we're, you know, and that's not what our organization is, you know, um, we're an activist organization, but we are also just, we, we focus on what our DNA is, and that is empowerment, it's education, and it's network, you know, and as we said to him, if you don't come in and teach them, who is? you know, you're at the top of, you know, your studio. Um, and if you don't come in and teach them, who's going to come in and teach them? So I think that there is this shift that has to happen where men come to the table and understand that they have to teach women. Because women teaching women is only going to take go so far based on, you know, where everybody stands within all of the industries. There's, um, you know, in social science, again, just a walking textbook around this issue. <laughs> Apologies. But... Um, uh, there's a concept of social points where you get or lose social points, social currency. And um, it's been documented that women and people of color, LGBTQ, any minority population in a room, if they're calling out questions of diversity, they tend to lose social points. Mm -hmm. But a heteronormative white guy asking the question about diversity and inclusion gains social points, right? So it's actually a super easy for the, for the men who feel inclined to be allies just to call the question, like if you're building a hiring list or if you're at the final decision, have we thought about, have we put an overlay of the question of inclusion here? Because a lot of things happen, right? In that comfort principle, we have, if, there, if, I'm, proceeding, if I'm looking at a resume and there's like a two year gap, on a resume of a 40-something woman who maybe is blonde and blue-eyed, I'm gonna fill in that two-year gap with all kinds of reasonable understanding of where I might have been over those two years. But if I see a resume of somebody who doesn't look like me with a different background, I look at that gap with like, oh, I wonder what they were doing in those, or I wonder why they weren't in the workforce then. I don't fill it in lovingly. I fill it in with sort of aspersions, right? That's our unconscious bias at work. Somebody has to provoke you out of that. We have to provoke each other collectively out of that. We also have to invite women and minority groups into the conversation. It's not easy to speak up when you're wildly outnumbered. So yeah. if in a company there are people who are part of a, a, a an you know, a, a population that is not, um, you know, white and male, they have to be invited in. They have to be empowered. They have to be asked questions. It's not comfortable to always speak up. Some people will, you know, um, I've got a big mouth. <laughs> There's a reason I stayed in the business as long as I did. I was fortunate that I was, you know, raised to speak up and I'm a bossy big sister, but not everybody has that. And we have to encourage the women and the minorities and, uh, you know, to, to come forward. And we have to give people jobs. And we have to, and I'm talking to myself when I say this too, give those early opportunities in communities where we don't see a lot of people in our businesses, whatever those businesses may be, those early opportunities so that there's a crop of new talent coming up that can step into the, you know, into the big jobs. If, if people don't get those early opportunities, if they're not sought out, if, if we don't ask people, hey, have you ever, you, you're really talented at, uh, at, at this. Have you ever considered this as a profession and then offer them an entry level job? It may never happen, and we won't have inclusion and diversity in our storytelling. I love that. I think it's really interesting, the provoke, which you used, and sort of the invite. And it seems like there's sort of this conversation between really being hard on people about this and it being very uncomfortable for them to be called out or whatever versus something a little bit more, we can do this. <laughs> I think, too, that the in terms of the, the question you ask about, like, there's a 
there's an equal role for men in the conversation about including women. There's, mm -hmm. there's actually, we all get to have this conversation. And, you know, a huge issue that we've seen, it's not, for me, the, the, the conversation of sexual harassment um, has been obviously, me too, this has obviously been a dominant conversation in the last year. We, we must remember that the rootstock of all this behavior is the same, and bullying is the, the vine of the tree that heads male to male often, or dominant to, to less dominant, right? So workplace civility is a massive question that goes across all of these issues and, and unites all gender and diversity around the question of how can we be kind and inclusive. It doesn't need to be a bellwether word for race and gender. It has to be for all of us to create, you know, we came out of the Second World War with a very S&M culture around corporate structure, very top down, very hierarchical. Like, it's time to remake that model, right, in a sincere way with complete intention. Yeah. Angela, when you talk about the program that you put in place, I mean, there were rules. You really set out rules for people we or, did. And, and real goals. Yeah, I'm going to consult my data sheet as I talk about <laughs> it. Um, but, uh, well, we, it was, we gave them 30 days and they had 12 months, but the, after the first year, we had a 60% increase in all of our worldwide agency teams. And that means, so just to be specific, BBDO went from 0 to 40%. Fred and Fareed went from 0 to 55%. So these are companies that hardly had any women, and they didn't have women working with us on our accounts, and we changed that. Just by saying there's a report card yeah. at the end of the year. And then we also worked with a great company called Free the Bid. Yeah. Um, they're kind of like you, but for advertising work, and you know, and it connects brands with female, ma you know, makers. And we did we did some great work with some of them. As you changed the numbers, did the quality of the work change? It did. I mean, the I mean, the quality of the work was good before, but the, um, I don't know if you remember, so there were a couple campaigns that we did last year around the holidays. And again, this isn't, this isn't my work, so um, I'm speaking about it sort of in a hypothesis way, but um, we did our, there was like a campaign that we did around the holidays that was um, with like these puppets in like a in a in a in an apartment complex. It was really beautiful, and anyway, but they were but they were so moving and touching, and um, and they were made by women. But it's, we don't co come out and say, oh, you know, this is a f film that's made by women. It's just a beautiful film that touched people's hearts in the holidays. Um, and we got the data back, and it was really strong. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, to me, it just seems like a no-brainer. I, I, I don't know. Like, it's like we're not saying anything revolutionary here, right? I mean, we know women make decisions on, on purchasing. We've been saying that for year, you know, as long as I've been in the business, is I've been making content for women, um, selling advertising to them. We all know this. And so if you have a story that's being told from an authentic place, no matter who's writing it or who's telling it, it's going to hit the audience better. It's I just, think we still have to say it, though, because the numbers aren't you're right. telling the story. Right, that's the head-scratching part of it, right? You're but, like, why? But also, there's the business case for it in movies, in, in media, in advertising. I mean, when women are the consumers, doesn't it stand to reason that women should have a very, very significant equal or majority um, stake in telling those stories. I mean, you, it, absolutely, but you're right, we still have work to do. And um, I think that the advertising and marketing industry along with the film industry is coming in that direction as well. By way of example, does anybody have any great examples of women at the helm from an advertising brand or any sort of storytelling? I mean, I, I think I'm seduced by gender balance, and I think The Handmaid's Tale is a exceptional, I mean, this is not advertising, but yeah. really extraordinary programming over the last couple of years, and something that, you know, we've, I mean, I, we all read it in college, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. um, and that was a male creator, a male executive producer, a female producing director, a female pilot director, lots of women in the writer's room, lots of female directors, lots of men involved, like, that that to me feels like a gold standard in a lot of ways because there was tremendous female leadership and there's tremendous male leadership right. there and that's a tremendous piece of work yep. you know and so I think there when we look at gender balance you see 
um, you see something that can be really exceptional. That was one of the first books I read as a freelance reader for 20th Century Fox when I started in the business, and I rejected it out of hand. I thought it was brilliant, <laughs> I loved it. I still have the coverage so I can prove that I said the good things, but I couldn't imagine telling that story, so I just want to thank Trump and Pence for creating an atmosphere <laughs> where it could succeed <laughs> and not feel like science fiction anymore. I don't know the step, but isn't it, isn't it the festival, this? This year, I think that the stat is like 45% of the filmmakers are women or something like that. Yeah, here, the trouble is we've had a really good representation at film festivals, though not as good as this year. This yeah. year is exceptional, but but festivals tend to be around 30%. Um, but we have this we have this myth that um, you know, and and Cheryl Sandberg really called it out, somewhat discredited Cheryl Sandberg, but. Um, uh, nonetheless, Lean In really looked at the fact that um, her generation was the first generation that was full equity at university and often even in engineering, et cetera, and that it didn't translate to the workplace. And the same thing is true of festivals. Festivals have lots of representation. It doesn't translate to the marketplace. And film schools, too. Right. Film so, schools as well. So we thought solving for education would solve for everything, and it doesn't, actually, and, and that there is this sort of leaky pipeline all the way through. Women in Animation is one of our big partners and they echo that and they're really digging in and trying to figure out the number of women in art school wanting to be and there's, I mean, it's single digits in the workforce. Um, okay, so marketers are trying to sort of approach this new era. We said like there's sort of this disconnect maybe between the aspiration and what they want to maybe the action. What are some pointers? in terms of their next creative project, the next campaign? Um, how do you go about it, and, and what are some good things to keep in mind? It's like I would say for your brand, as you're starting to develop these campaigns and stick to the DNA of the company, um, I think that there are some brands out there that are trying to enter the cultural zeitgeist of identifying with causes, and I think if the cause is not natural to what your brand is, it's, it's transparent and it's not authentic. Um, and you know, at Women in Entertainment, one of the things that we've experienced is we support Me Too, we support Time's Up. Um, and I think over the past couple of years, you know, Gretchen and I have done a lot of programming. We've done a lot of content. Um, you know, two years ago, we woke up to our summit day, and Trump was president. Our second the day, the day after. after. Um, the second at the year after that, we had the Weinstein. Harvey's article came out the on day. Monday of our <laughs> press release. I mean, we're like, we're not fun. making this up. So, you know, and I think one of the things that we've always, that we're constantly challenged on is what is our voice in it? And I think when Gretchen and I started the organization, one of the things that we were very, you know, at a minimum, and one of the things that we had learned from our mentors is always go back to what the mission of the company is, what is the mission of the brand. And our brand at Women in Entertainment is about education, it's about building network, it's about connecting people, and it's positive action. And you know, having the day after Trump, it's like I was on the phone, I think, that morning with every moderator that it's not a soapbox. We're not here to talk about it. We're not here to mail bash. We are not, we only tell stories of positivity because positivity resonates. And we have seen that over the course of the past three years with our membership, you know, very close to, you know, 10,000 people um, and growing every day. And we, that day, we filled the, the Cinerama Dome, if you're familiar with it in Los Angeles, 800 people was full. And Every single person there took that day to figure out something positive. It was, I'm going to run for my school board. I'm going to get involved in politics. I'm going to mentor you. There was nobody who was boohooing and whatever will I do. And, and that was really true to our mission. Yeah, it's like after the Weinstein um, kind of explosion that happened, um, you know, we were very much dinged at our summit for not approaching it and not talking about sexual abuse. And that's, you know, and we were, we had long conversations about how to respond to that to the Hollywood Reporter and the rap and variety. You know, there was always that one line in there. And for our brand, it didn't make sense. Can I just say, I think that it's a symptom. Yeah. I think it's really great that people who've been victimized and who've been holding it in can now come out and say oh, something absolutely. and that they have over, over the past two years and now it's been normalized that you don't have to hold it as a dirty little secret or something absolutely. you did. That's great. But it is a symptom yeah. of, a a, of, a, of a problem of not enough gender parity. If we had 
gender parity in the entertainment industry, we would create a climate where that kind of behavior just wasn't tolerated, yeah. where it wouldn't be comfortable for predators. And, you know, the, the really, it, the, the predators who were exposed, you know, they, they proliferated because there wasn't a climate where that was considered a bad thing. And with yeah. more women in more power positions, and there were women in power positions, but not enough, in my opinion, um, th that kind of um, victimization doesn't happen. So I think it's fine to, you know, th those, those forums are in place, those outlets are in place yeah. for people who need to process to, what they've been through, but it. we also need to find ways to make the change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think that also comes through networking and it comes through mentorship and it comes through having conversations. It's like this woman over here did a workshop for us a couple of years ago and I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, we host workshops throughout the year um, for folks, for creatives, and she held a production workshop and it was with Julie Lynn from Mockingbird Pictures. And they literally told the whole room to shut down their phones and they went through every project and they sat there saying, oh, you're working with this person at Warner, this is how you get around it, this is how you do this. And every single person who walked out of that room literally just thanked them and had a game plan moving forward for each one of their projects. And that was so important and it was just, you cannot put any sort of impression on that. I'd love to hear about mentorship and how to be a good mentor to women. What, what is the, the practical? Pick me, yeah. pick me. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I, well, let's distinguish between mentorship and sponsorship. Okay. So, um, mentorship is meaningful, but women are over-mentored and under-sponsored. So what do I mean by that, right? There, there are a lot of coffees that are had. There's a lot of, like, conversation that is had. Sponsorship, and that's meaningful, right? For me to exchange my, to, to articulate how... I got through something, how I might help you get through something. The much more powerful and potent tool that um, inherently men have done for men and men need to do for women and women need to do for women is to give a stamp of approval in a very direct way. So Colin Trevorrow debuted Safety Not Guaranteed at Sundance in the same year that Ava DuVernay did Middle of Nowhere. I think I have that right. She won Sundance, he made a lovely film. He was directing Jurassic World within nine months of that. I think he was hired within three months. Um, and it took her another film and another win at Sundance and Oprah, who sponsors people. Um, so Spielberg and Brad Bird and hiring Colin said, gosh, he really just reminds me of myself. So I will often show a slide of Colin and Spielberg together, and you're like, <laughs> literally, <laughs> they look alike. Did they um, both wear white sneakers and jeans baseball and baseball caps? But like we were talking about hair. this on the walk down when we got lost and yeah. couldn't find this place. It was my fault. Yeah, and no, it wasn't your fault. <laughs> but but we we talked about how people will say, but there are no women who have the experience for the job. I was I was told this by a big, big movie star Academy Award winner who is starring in a TV series and wanted to put women up for directing gigs. And I said, let me make a list of qualified women who can direct you and then you can go champion those women. And she said, okay, gave me her email address. And I stayed up till two in the morning making the list and the list wasn't very long. All the women who had done series episodes like that. But then I started thinking about the women who should get the job and who should get the chance and who, if they were a man, would be given that opportunity. And I, I told Tessa the, the list tripled. And so I sent it to her and I said, here's the list of the no-brainers, the, the people who already have the stamp of approval. And it's pretty boring because they get all the work. But if you really want to make change, give opportunities to these women who, if they were men, they would get the job because they have the work to back themselves up. They've made great independent films. They might not have directed an episode, but they deserve to be given the first job. Well, and speaking to the previous question of like, what are the tips? Like, I don't know from advertising, but it seems to me that there is this potential lower bar for entry when there's a, a much greater platform of what is branding and advertising and marketing now. We have such a, and you know, recognizing our own unconscious bias around um, the dollar increase, you know, the stuff that you deal with, mm -hmm. right? And, and seeing like, 
well, we do this level of marketing and advertising that's not such a high price. Right. It doesn't have such a high cost. So let's really dedicate thoughtfully, let's really think about inclusion around those filmmakers so that they are familiar to us and as our budgets increase, we can bring them into For our the big the, job. The yeah. farm yeah. team yeah. theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I think what I you're saying uh, is what you were talking about, getting out of the comfort zone. So we are in this business because we're creative people. We like to be creative. Well, the creativity starts with who you hire, mm -hmm. right? And so just in doing the same thing again and again, I'm sorry, but that's really boring. Like, it's more fun to break the rules, and it's more fun to discover talent, and it's more fun to do something that you've never done before and then surprise everybody. That's way more rewarding. So push yourself to do that. Well, I think what's interesting is, Angela, you went directly, right, to Sarah? Yes. In um, terms of, like, you kind of skipped over the agency process yes, for this I, I mean, project that you did. Yeah, I mean, mainly because we're not part of an agency, so it was... It was right, but, it, but it, it was a conscious decision because I knew the voice I wanted, mm -hmm. and so I didn't need to go to... I, and I knew how to contact them, and, I, you know, it was just an easy thing because I envisioned that what we were creating, and it was their voice. And they're, I think of them as auteurs. And I think that that type of um, thinking could be, should be applied to brand storytelling. And agencies can certainly do that for you. You know, we're all, not everybody has the time to um, understand portfolios and keep an eye out for filmmakers. But if, if you have the opportunity to do that yourself and to know who is the talent behind the films and, and look at films that aren't in brand storytelling. I mean, Sarah and Tom, they didn't have a huge portfolio and of expertise in this space of brand storytelling. But that doesn't mean they couldn't be brought in to break the mold. And I think that's part of it too, is like just look outside of the, the, the average venues. And so if you're working with an agency and they're bringing the same names to you again and again, like make them work harder for you to think outside the box and have them bring talent who have not done branded work before. It'll be okay. You might have to work a little harder on some things. You may have to explain it up the, the chain a bit, um, but the result could be something really moving and you'll learn yeah, along I mean, the way. And I think Tom and I, we've been partners for 12 or 13 years and um, so we sort of have one mind about a lot of things, but you know, obviously I bring my perspective and he, he brings his, but um, we went a little bit rogue back about 13 years ago. We kind of looked at what was happening and um, we met with a lot of agencies, we, you know, um, and they, they would kind of say things like, uh, but you know you have to be available when we want you, so you can't book yourselves up six months in advance, or you know, all the, it was, or why do you need us? Because you're already working with your direct to client, and we would go back and forth, and so ultimately we just decided to go rogue and try to form relationships on our own. And actually, when you put a filmmaker right in front of a, a brand um, or or a anything that you're, you know, we do a lot of installation work for museums. We do a lot of, you know, uh, big scale projects like that. And once they get in a room, like once I'm staring at them in the eye, male or female, and we're having a conversation, it's like the barriers really do seem to fall. I've seen this happen. Yeah. No, seriously. And um, the barriers fall. But if they if they see me on paper. You know, or if, um, you know, these are where the, the stopping points are. So it's just getting in the room. It's just getting across the table because I feel like it's the minute I get across the table, it's, you know, we're there. We have a creative moment and we're there. It's huge. The, the, the paper question is a huge one. Mm -hmm. In orchestras in the 70s, we were graduating as many women as men from music school, but orchestras were 94% male. And there was a, a woman in, in Iowa who looked at that and said, I bet the problem, we're siphoning all the women into teaching music. I bet if at the audition stage we put a curtain up, it would change things. And it did, but not a ton, until another woman came and said, you know what, I bet if we make everyone take their shoes off, <laughs> we now have dominant women in orchestras. It's meaningful because it's just the first stage. Because once you get the first stage through an audition, you're then playing in quartets, you're playing with the orchestra, you're seen, you're visible, you don't remain anonymous in the way that Sarah doesn't remain anonymous past. But it's really important for, past the first stage that we try to remove all of the barriers of un our unconscious bias to begin to engage the artist, the person, past that. And can I ask, I mean, 
just to put it back on us, I mean, I feel like I have unconscious bias when I'm hiring yeah, um, DPs. We do. we do. And, you know, I have to think about this all the time. Like, you know, I'll look at a DP and also think to myself, well, this is what a DP, like, th I am in good hands with this DP. This is, you know, um, and I have to backstep mm -hmm. and think, like, wait, this is because I'm con I've been doing this for so long and my, when I started my career, this is what DPs look like. But the and cameras are smaller now. <laughs> yeah, the cameras are smaller now. So, um, and, and, but, you know, like Kristen Johnson I've yeah. worked with, and, you know, she's this, like, yeah, six foot four, Christian. like, powerhouse of a woman. Maybe a little DP. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I think like even within our own, um, you know, our, in ourselves, I think we have to struggle if you're any, in any sort of hiring position to make sure you're not, you know, succumbing to the same biases. Yes. Um, we all have it. I mean, that's, that's the structural piece, right? Sexism and racism and homophobia. Like, except that we all, we all are inside that system. None of us is outside of it, right? So it's all of our collective obligation. It, nobody's exempt from it. Though I did my first and most powerful uh, DP was a woman, and so my bias is totally for female DPs. I was going to say the same thing. I have conscious bias. I'm looking for female DPs yeah, yeah. of color. Ava Berkowski. In terms of access, are there resources that anybody has that can share with the room in terms of, you know, lists? Sure. Um, if you go to the AFI DWW website, there's the name of the women who have gone through that program on a list, and they're all exceptional filmmakers. Um, the director's list um, is uh, Destry Martino's list. She is uh, Film Powered has a list, uh, and those are producers and directors and dimensionally. They're, they're Film Powered is having an event right now. I know. I know. So the the uh, head of Film Powered, Jen McGowan who you can find very easily online, is here in Sundance, if you want to talk to her. And she is keeping a database of women who can be hired in any job in media. Women we, in entertainment. Yeah, women in entertainment actually <laughs> have a list. So we launched an AI platform about two years ago um, in a partnership with 10,000 Coffee. Um, and it allows directors to connect with directors, directors to connect with writers. Um, so it really, it changes um, what mentorship really is, and that's, what the platform is meant for. So if you want to sit down and put together just a brainstorm, you can absolutely do that. So if you join our membership, which is free, um, you'll have access to that platform and you can pull talent from that. And we have partners that are women in animation, like we mentioned, women in film, you see our creative, uh, women in tech, women in uh, female cinematography organization. You know, These are all groups. We, we really have a focus in 2019 of below the line. So we have a lot of resources and a lot of partners that would love to be, have that connection. Shout out to Free the Bid, which has actually one of the best sites to find uh, creative, female creatives, d d uh, producer, directors, amazing. Really Great. well designed. Awesome. Um, back to the sponsorship, mentorship. Can people talk about personal experiences with that? I had a, I had a mentor um, that was a, a president of a film company. Um, and I remember he would always give me like this advice and it was so like, it was like balls out advice. And I, he would tell me to do things and I would think, I can't, I can't do that. Like I have to pay my mortgage. Like he would, he, I, but he gave me advice that no woman ever gave me, which he would say like, I don't know, you should just give him an ultimatum. Either you're a VP or you're out of there. And I'd be like, what? I, 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 I can't do that. <laughs> They're gonna walk me out the door. But it was really interesting because most of my mentors were, have been women and they've been amazing and tough and you know, really pushing me along and spo more sponsors, I think, because I've gotten many jobs from them. But this one experience with a film company president was kind of transformative. And I didn't take his advice, but I still think about it all the time. You were probably smart not to take it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> women aren't yeah, judged in the worked? same way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think I, some of my sort of best mentorship was getting in on email chains that I wasn't supposed to read. <laughs> you know, like when you get forwarded sort of your, your piece of the budget, but they forget that they've got, gone down the line and everyone's weighed in. And I started to quickly, you know, and in these cases it was primarily men uh, kind of start getting the big budgets. And I started kind of putting it together, what the markups were and what I was getting paid and the things that were being said. And I was just, like I pretty much at that point understood that, um, whatever it was that they said they had for us, they were lying. 
Mm. Um, and so I had absolutely no problem asking for more money ever. And I feel like um, that was just something I, I learned from kind of looking behind the curtain. Um, and that's not necessarily, you know, it's not mentorship, but it's, it's, it's research, <laughs> I guess. I, I feel like there's, you know, that Dr. Seuss book, the Are You My Mother, right? <laughs> the, um, and there's a little, like, Are You My Mentor? Um, are You My Producer? Um, and I, I really believe, like, there's a vast panoply of wonderful people who can help guide you, right? Take notes, pay attention. I love peer mentorship, actually. And um, my group of women who went through DWW, there are eight of us. Um, I just ran into several of them in the airport. You know, we got together all the time and held each other accountable to goals we had set, you know, and sort of said, how are you doing with that? Or I didn't get to that, but, and we gave each other suggestions and we've recommended each other for jobs. And we sort of like, there's a piece, and we brought people in who were senior to us to talk to us. So there's something really about start where you are, Sometimes I think we're looking for that thing. And where we are, there's so much to be drawn from. Are you hard on each other? Yeah, a gentle hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I think you really have to look at the person and kind of what we were talking about, our own unconscious bias. My best mentor, if, you know, on paper, you'd think, really? You would run a feminine or women's organization? And he was old school, you know, this old gruff guy. I was a brand new filmmaker. I was like 22 years old. He threw me in the deep end of the pool. He was there. He was there behind the scenes, but he let me own every decision. There was never a studio that was going to call and say, you know, Gretchen won't open my film, and you don't even want to know the territory, Bowling Green, Kentucky, um, the territories I was handling at the time, but he would never go back on my decision, and it was so great, and I treated my film buyers like that later, and then I had a woman who was the, the COO of a company I worked for. She was terrible. She was the worst. She, you know, she kept everyone down. She didn't want anyone making a decision, having a voice, growing. So, uh, you know, I think that message is there. It has, it's the person and they're, you know, don't get too closed off on who could be that possible mentor. It's like, I had a mentor for about seven years. I was an agency and, um, I went with her to a couple agencies, and she was great because she gave me a lot of access, but at the same time, similar to what your experience was, it was only so far. <laughs> you know, so I started taking advice, and I think just because I'm, you know, um, I have a PR background, I had a lot of access to a lot of different CEOs, you know, in my career, and I just listened to them, um, you know, and I can't pinpoint one, but you know, sitting down and, and watching CEOs talk to a corner office or having those behind the scenes conversations about the lessons they learned, instead of just listening and taking notes and transcribing them, you know, like an AC does or an SAE does in an agency, you know, I paid attention. And, um, you know, about five years ago, I took the leap to start my own PR boutique. And I go back to all of those notes in terms of the lessons learned that I want to remember that I thought were really great that resonated with other companies, um, some that I can't you know, put into motion, but some I can, um, just based on size or just, you know, what the, we provide service, we're not a product company. Um, but, you know, I think it's just paying attention to the world around you. I've been mentored and sponsored and I try to do the same. I mean, I, I think you have to do yeah. both. And some of my best sponsors have been men um, who've been in powerful positions. Barry Diller, um, when I was at Fox, kind of took me under his wing as did multiple presidents gave me good advice, gave me um, promotions. And I had a female um, mentor who the role of, you know the Sigourney Weaver character in Working Girl, mm -hmm. who sort of um, brings Melanie Griffith along in a rather cruel way. Well, that role was based on this mentor. Mm -hmm. So you have an idea, <laughs> if you've seen the movie, it's, I know it's an old movie by now, but that, that's what she was like. And she gave me like, the, the single best piece of advice I ever got that I think is good for men and women, which is do your job like you're not afraid to be fired. Mm. So that's how I went through my days at the studio because it's easy to be scared whether you're at an agency or a studio because you're always guessing, always taking chances. You do your best work when you take your biggest risks. and. That was great I advice. love that. We, um, we do need to wrap up, but I think that is a great segue into final words of wisdom for the room. God, 
Um, no pressure. <laughs> wisdom. I got no wisdom. I rapped too late last night. Um, I mean, I'm in. I'm enthusiastic that people are are leaning into this conversation and um, thinking constructively um, and collectively about what we can all do to support and encourage each other, irrespective of who we are, where we came from. I mean, I've got no wisdom, but I um, I am heartened. I have um, a favorite quote, and I think it actually originated with a Bible quote. I should remember this, but it's, don't be lazy in your heart. And nobody in this room is lazy. Everybody here is working hard and hustling. And I know I have to check myself sometime when I want to take the easy path, and it may not be the right path, and I know that's being lazy in my heart. So that's my... It's like I just, it, it, from an advice standpoint, it's just, I think it's just hustle and listen. And I also just don't think it... I think inclusion just needs to be equality. Um, and I think everybody needs that equal voice. I'd say take a risk, get uncomfortable with somebody who's nothing like you and who you think is really talented. I, I think it's all been said over and over again. But um, yeah, I would just say don't be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would just say uh, create, create work. Don't get like bogged down by sort of what everybody else thinks or all your ch what your chances are of getting it out there. Just create. Thank you.